All right, everybody. Welcome back. Joining us from London. Sound like you're from London. Sorry, that's a rule. I have to play that when you're on the show, Justin. Is our good friend Justin Bronk. Justin, it's been a few weeks since we had you on the channel. Welcome back. Thank you. So you've been it's, on. Uh, the I should say it's my new digs, which is why it's completely empty. Um, it's very, very Spartan. Very Spartan looking. <laughs> At um, some point, so I'll get some aircraft pictures. I promise. <laughs> Okay, good. We look forward to that. So you've been on the road. You were recently in Canada. What was that all about? Uh, I went to visit the uh, the guys at Three Wing, the, the Hornet squadrons, uh, 433 and 425 uh, there, which was uh, fascinating. It's a genuinely unique blend of things because they fly U.S. Navy aircraft with U.S. Air Force tactics and an RAF heritage slash uh, organizational structure. It's a very weird one. Um, and of course, the primary NORAD mission set, which is uh, most notably, the ranges are as long, if not longer, than you'd see in the Pacific. Um, so, you know, they're talking one and a half thousand, two thousand clicks uh, in in flights. You know, they go and stage up out of um, Thule in in uh, Greenland, and then right up uh, to the North Pole. Uh, so, one of the guys um, who uh, sort of took me under his wing for the visit there was saying that he'd uh, done a flight up to the North Pole. And then uh, had a tank of failure, had to have, you know, the, the hose was leaking or something. And then another tank had to come, you know, a bit of a kind of clenching situation there. <clears throat> and then ended up flying all the way back to Bag Baggerville Direct. And it was, you know, close on an eight hour salty. So, um, you know, crazy distances that they go up there. And of course, almost no diverts of any kind because it's completely empty. Um, <laughs> so really some some very impressive flying that they do up there. Um, and with, with aircraft that? that are, you know, getting on so uh they, they struggle with you know excellent maintainers but uh they, they they do it in spite of the aircraft not necessarily because of them as a tomcat guy i can relate um so when you say north pole i'm just seeing the movie elf the beginning when he's you know bob newhart his dad sends him on his way and um you know so forth and so on I, that like you said no diverts up there uh that that's kind of a scary proposition so before we go any further we should recognize Today is the 78th anniversary of Operation Overlord, the invasion of D-Day. You're in England. The forces left from your shores 78 years ago today. So, uh, you know, this is a good time to think about the bravery and just what it would take. This per per picture particularly is one I'm drawn to. Uh, you can see some of the fire there on the shore and this is one of the early waves and the look in those guys' eyes, they're trying to figure out what are we in for here? You know, it, this is one of where, those, where do we get such men moments? So 78 years ago today. Yeah, it's uh, sobering stuff. I mean, especially given we're in many ways seeing a, a modern version of that now in the sense of, you know, I imagine we'll be telling, you know, at finding out about it and analyzing for years, but the, the stories of, <clears throat> you know, everyday heroism by everyday people in Ukraine uh, and, you know, the, the question of where did they get those people and the argument, the answer is probably the same, which is when you're faced with what's seen as an existential threat, uh, ordinary people do utterly extraordinary things on, on a pretty regular basis. Well said. It's, it's and we, we heard this. It is inspiring. We heard this from Lucky Luckadoo in that episode. If you have not watched the episode Badass B-17 pilot, I recommend you do so because Lucky exudes that just matter of factly. There's no bravado. It's like, well, how did you fly into the teeth of hell like that? He's like, that was my duty. Um, it's just what we were going to do. I'm actually doing some research for an episode about Robin Olds, which will be coming out later this week. And his memoir just, it jumps off the page how much of this, this was present in not just Robin Olds, but just his cohort, this generation, where they would just do what was asked of them because it was the situation that required it. Um, so... You know, that I, I concur, Justin. I think we're still seeing this. I'm asked often, uh, since I hang out at the Naval Academy a lot, uh, by my peers, my classmates and other oldsters, hey, do you think the youngsters still got it? And my answer is yes. You know, if the circumstance demanded this level of commitment and courage, I am confident that this generation would rise to that challenge. So I think we're in we're in good hands. Having just had graduation here a couple of weeks ago and we're actually getting ready for indoctrination day for the new plea class, class of 2026. How old do I feel? Um, coming up here at the end of this month. You know, so the cycle continues and uh, you know we're making them making them ready. So 
this weekend was also, as anybody who was watching TV, all the Royal Watchers uh, on, on this side of the, the Atlantic saw that it was the Jubilee celebration. And you and I were in comms prepping for this live stream. And you mentioned that uh, your social calendar was kind of booked. <laughs> so how did it go? I know the Queen's Health was sort of a question mark. Um, but how did it go in terms of uh, what you saw all around you in London? I mean, it, it, London was um, <laughs> enormously busy, as you'd expect. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things being how many people there were uh, in London who were tourists from around the rest of the UK, um, typically on kind of busy weekends. Uh, it'll, it'll be a lot of, of overseas tourists, and there were lots of those too. But it was noticeable how many people came from all over the rest of the UK. Um, so it's a bit more... <laughs> Uh, regionally diverse than usual uh, and of course you know amazing fly past um, with pretty much every type in the RAF um, you know represented from the the Battle of Britain Memorial flight through uh, amazing kind of 70 um, formation with the typhoons uh, the uh, then they got six F-35s uh, included in the fly past including those with the Vespina um, VIP jet which is also a, <clears throat> a frontline tanker um, yeah, and, and of course, the, the, all the various helicopter fleets as well, uh, and the ISR fleets, uh, mobility fleets represented. So, so uh, that yeah. the airplane in, in formation with the F 35s is, is that the, is that like Royal One or what, what is that airplane used for? <laughs> so it's, it's called Vespina. It, it's the, it, it is the equivalent of Air Force One. Um, it's got a conversion uh, in, 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 inside, so additional communications capabilities. Uh, and a kind of VIP uh, suite, but it's uh, a conversion of one of the RAF's uh, A330 MRTT, so multi-role tanker transports, um, and uh, it continues to do uh, its regular tanker duties, um, including supporting quick reaction alert sorties when it's not being used as a VIP transport. So uh, it's kind of dual role in that respect. And as you'll see under the wings there, it still has its refueling uh, drogue pods. Ah, okay. um, so it remains, a, remains tanker capable. Yeah. I, I, can you imagine tanking off of Air Force One? <laughs> that would be pretty <laughs> amazing. Um, and of course, uh, Prince Lewis made some headlines with his antics. Uh, precocious young boy. <clears throat> I guess he can be forgiven for that. Well, so, you've got to, uh, you got to, got to let children be children, right? Yeah, I think so. Right. Um, so let me take a sip here real quick. No problem. I'm doing the same. The pollen here is uh, awful. Yeah, that's, I think that's what's happening here. Um, so we had some NGAD news. The Air Force announced that they're moving IOC to the left, 2030. Um, so what are your thoughts associated with that announcement? I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating. That there's quite a lot that's, that's incredibly intriguing about NGAD. Um, I mean, first and foremost, uh, the, the, the cost profile and how, much, how it's going to fit into the broader um, future fighter program uh for the for the u.s air force so the usaf has a huge issue with the age of its fighter fleets um the average age i believe of u.s fighter aircraft u.s air force fighter aircraft is now about 29 and a half um it's one of the oldest major air forces in the world in terms of the, the average uh fighter age um in terms of airframes now of course those airframes have been repeatedly upgraded and that you know have some of the most capable sensors and weapons in the world but the airframes themselves are really, really old compared to most air forces. Uh, and that translates into significantly higher maintenance requirements, significantly higher um, failure rates in terms of shorter mean time between failures, uh, and basically being very, very expensive to run. Um, it's not helped by the fact that um, US uh, support kind of arrangements for, for the US Air Force and indeed the other services are partly dictated by congressional uh, politics. So they're kind of far more spread out and, and diffuse around various states than they would ideally be if you were managing them centrally, um, which contributes to, to having higher support costs than you'd expect from fleets the size the US runs. Uh, but generally speaking, the, the US has an issue not just with its fighters aging out and so needing urgent replacement. And of course, F-22 was produced in far sh smaller numbers than uh, was intended. And then they, obviously the F-15s had to be run on uh, far, far longer. Um, but also, of course, the F-22 unit cost was higher and operating costs were higher and, and support was much more difficult because the line closed early. Uh, and this is kind of replicated across the USAF fleets more broadly. So they not only face the issue that they can't afford to modernize uh, their fleets to fifth generation, let alone sixth, fast enough, but they also face the issue that because it's been so slow, 
uh, and so much longer because they basically spent 10 to 15 years spending all their money on counterinsurgency related tasks um, and, and programs that it costs more and more and more to run the current fleets that they have and to keep them airworthy and safe. Uh, and so that's less and less and less going into modernization. So it's this kind of dual squeeze between the fleets getting ever older and needing replacement more urgency and also getting ever more expensive to run and therefore the money for modernization being tighter and tighter. Uh, it doesn't help that the US Air Force in terms of its official budget actually loses, I think between about 15 and 20% of that money to what's called pass through funding. So funding that is appropriated and goes to the US Air Force, but actually the, then is spent on other programs and the US Air Force doesn't have any um, any say over what, how it's spent and it doesn't go directly to US Air Force capabilities. Um, so in that kind of context where they're trying to, they've been forced to buy US, uh, buy F-15EX, which they didn't really necessarily want to do, um, but uh, in terms of the, the, the US Air Force itself didn't really want to do it. But now that they're getting it, it's interesting we're seeing this role shift from Initially, it was going to be a like-for-like -like replacement with more capable, of course, um, for the F-15Cs in the territorial defense role, in effect, so primarily the Air National Guard. Um, but you're actually seeing a shift towards a smaller number of aircraft procured more quickly um, and seemingly being um, sent toward to do a kind of outsized weapons truck role, uh, particularly in the Pacific with the Guam-based squadrons out there. Um, and so it, perhaps actually F-16 may be going to be taking over some of those, um, you know, Konos based F-15C squadron uh, tasks instead of F-15EX. Uh, that primarily being, one, being because one of the answers that the US Air Force is coming up with now in terms of trying to, you know, reduce those operating costs in order to spend more on modernization to improve capability is to look at a lot of mission sets and go, well, regardless of what does it now, F-16 is significantly cheaper to run than anything else we have. Can this mission be done adequately by an F-16? If the answer is yes, then why isn't it being done by an F-16? If there's a good answer, then fine, we won't. But if there's no good answer, then let's do it with an F-16 and save the money to modernize other capabilities in other squadrons with other missions. Um, and F-15EX is probably partly being used to mature technologies that will go on to NGAD as well. Um, but of course, the F-35 is, is the big kind of question in all of this as well, because it's clearly more, much more expensive to run than, than the USAF wanted. Um, but it's also the only thing that's really credible in, in highly defended airspace that they have in terms of tactical fighters at the moment. Uh, and it's, it's going to be the kind of the core capability across all the different um, you know, commands. However, in that mix, you've also now got to find room for NGAD, which of course is seen as critical um, to the extent that uh, General Brown, the, the uh, chief of the US Air Force, was willing to, in effect, sacrifice the F-22 fleet early in order to free up money for buying NGAD more quickly to bring it forward. Um, and he probably wouldn't have done that without you know, a serious degree of confidence in whatever NGAD is currently already demonstrating. And so, you know, he must have a lot of confidence in that, in that program, um, but also clearly the, the, the monetary requirements are huge. He, they're talking about Pacific relevant ranges and that means you know, that the, the longest combat radius for a current inventory USAF tactical fighter is the F-15E, which if you put full conformal fuel tanks uh, and the three bag uh, layout, or you probably only go with two um, because a third bag doesn't really add very much at those long ranges because of the extra drag and weight, um, you're looking at maybe 700 to 750 nautical miles, depending on the mission profile flown, which is a very long way. But you know that's kind of Pacific range Getting, getting towards Pacific range uh, suitable. But if you want a stealth fighter to do that, and we've already heard from General Carlisle, or Carlisle, uh, the, the commander of our combat command, uh, as well as General Nahum, that uh, they want not only Pacific range, but they want uh, broadband stealth. So they want it to be very low observable in multiple parts of the radar spectrum, not just the, the kind of X and Q band, which is where fire control radars typically operate and where things like the F-22 and the F-35 are optimized. They want broadband stealth, um, so something like a B2, which is easier to actually do physics-wise on a really big airframe, but anyway. So it's going to be pretty expensive stealth-wise, but it also means that they're definitely going to have to have all the weapons and fuel internal. Uh, so you can't hang big fuel tanks on the outside. And so if you're looking at 750 nautical miles for the sake of argument, maybe even a 1,000, um, even with very efficient engines, you're looking at a platform the size of an F-111 minimum, um, just by dint of physics. 
And a stealthy platform the size of an F-111 is going to cost, you know, $300, $350 million a tail. Um, and I put this to, to um, a senior USAF officer at a conference and, you know, as a question and said, you know, given what you just said about range, stealth requirements, et cetera, aren't you looking at something the size of an F-111 with advanced stealth and weaponry and therefore a tail cost of 320 to $350 million? And he basically said, to paraphrase, yeah, you just answered your own question, but it, it will be incredibly expensive. But you know what's more expensive is losing to a peer adversary in a, in a conflict. And so, you know, clearly the USAF has decided they have no choice but to do this. They need something with far less tanker dependency than something like an F-22, which is quite short on legs um, for the Pacific, um, not just for the range, but also for the threat that China poses to tankers. And so you can see a scenario where like a four ship of F-22s, even if the Chinese couldn't find and kill them, if they kill the tankers, then the F-22s may run out of range and go down somewhere in the Pacific on their way home, even if they if they, they can't get the fighters. So, you know, there's a, there's a vulnerability point there too about reducing the tanker dependency. Um, but how it fits into the USAF fighter plan, uh, I don't know. It just, it's a level of cost, not, in, not just in terms of, of acquisition, but also operating cost by dint of a combination of stealth and max takeoff weight that is going to be well in excess, I would suggest, of anything the USAF currently flies in terms of fighters. And it's having to be procured in the midst of this extraordinary bow wave of modernization costs, everything from new trainers and T7, which is a very impressive piece of kit, but you know, there's a lot of them to buy. Um, F-35, of course, they need to keep buying F-15EX. They're trying to get those all done in the, in the, the next four or five years. Um, yeah, F-16 modernization to keep that platform relevant. Be, uh, yeah, kit yeah, long long range bomber, the tankers, long yeah. range bomber with with B twenty one, the unmanned adjunct that's going to be apparently coming alongside that. Um, you know, replacement for Reaper, um, which would be much more survivable. So they hope um, probably a range of of you know additive capabilities, read UCAVs, um, you know, along the lines of things that we've seen with X forty five, X forty seven B for the Navy. Um, you know, looking at the Skyborg program for some of the AI um, or machine learning enabled control programs they're looking at there because of course any unmanned system that you want to use in a high-end conflict uh, has to be designed with high levels of in-flight autonomy because you're going to be jammed you're going to have comlink, comlink denial at various points of flight so it has to be able to do its mission without real-time connectivity um yeah it's, it's just difficult to see how they're going to fit another really ambitious fighter program into that sort of schedule um so it's, it's a fascinating program so brian asked did i know captain chuck wyatt uh, uh, Cuds, I know him very well. Um, he left the Navy and flew for Southwest for a few years. So that's uh, uh, just a random question I thought I should answer. Uh, yes, Brian, I do know uh, Chuck Wyatt. Um, so you mentioned, Justin, the calculus that the chief of staff has to go through. Uh, this is not unlike what some of his predecessors have had to do, where they punted on, they tried to punt on A-10 in lieu of F-35, uh, saying that the world had passed the A-10 by, uh, kind of the same thing they're saying now about the legacy version of the F-22. Um, and then the taxpayers left kind of wondering why we paid that much per airplane for it to do little to nothing during its lifespan, except the A-10 had all kinds of utility. And it was interesting how basically ground forces created great hue and cry about, then what are you going to support us with since we're still like fighting this war in Afghanistan and I think at the time the war in Iraq was still going on with a lot of CAS happening. And they tried to trump up the F-35 as a close air support platform. It didn't, it didn't literally didn't fly. Uh, nobody bought that. So they kind of had to keep the A-10 on the books for a few years past what they needed to. But now we hear the same logic from the chief of staff. And this is what Elaine Luria was talking about during my interview with her about the Navy shipbuilding program. The Air Force has the same theme, which is divest to invest. However, it, as you just outlined very deftly, it's unclear what they're divesting, right? They, they want a lot of stuff. It's a pretty full plate of next-gen capabilities across every mission area that the Air Force has cognizance of. So as you said, it's kind of hard to see where they're going to shoehorn mm -hmm. this NGAD program in. Plus, like all good procurement programs, and we've talked about this before, there's a lot of marketing to it and buzzwords and alternately manned or optionally manned. And the latest thing to come out on this announcement 
was this idea that, okay, I know we told you we're going to have F-35 for 50 years, and that's, that's the economy of scale, you know, kind of like an aircraft carrier, Ford class aircraft carrier, like, well, this will be a 50 year uh, platform. So, you know, it really is cheap when you look at it per annum, but now they're going, forget that logic. We're going to build these for short bursts of time and then we'll spiral develop or incrementally improve them as we go on. And to your point, you want to talk about an expensive proposition, not to mention the bow wave of procurement. I don't know how this is doable against how we do procurement these days. Yeah, I mean, so I, I have some sympathy with some of it in the sense that when you, you hear a lot of kind of buzzwordy sounding things are talking about next generation programs, uh, whether in the US or, or in Europe or elsewhere, uh, you know, about digital design, testing, prototyping, digital twinning, so that you, you always have a, a you know, a perfect digital representation of each airframe so that you can tinker and play with things and without actually changing the metal and until you decide until you've decided and tested what you want to do so that you basically fa do your early failures in in the virtual environment and and, and therefore save money on, on labor costs you know metal etc um and th there is a lot of truth to that um in the sense that it is genuinely possible to design develop test and field a comparable capability far faster and probably in real terms cheaper than it previously it would have been but of course that is partially offset by the fact that um we're not looking at developing what we developed in the past cheaper we're looking at trying to develop something again much more lethal complex survivable capable compl you know, complicated difficult cutting edge than what already exists and so i i struggle to see you know for example new new trainer aircraft things like the the uh, m346 M or the the really interestingly the boeing saab um t7 for for the us air force um you know they have genuinely been designed and, and fielded and tested much more much more quickly and much more rapidly than uh, you know, previous generations of, of, of equivalently complicated airplanes. Same for some of the, the relatively cutting edge prototypes on UCAVs and things, uh, whether that be Australia's Loyal, loyal Wingman program, you know, the Valkyrie, um, or, you know, Banshee, or various other things, you know, BAE's Tyrannus. Uh, there is a lot you can do that is breaking some of that. Every airplane has to cost you know, a, a multiple of what the previous one did paradigm. But at the same time, I, it, you know, it doesn't change physics, it doesn't change the fact that you still have to buy these airplanes, support them, train pilots on them, all the rest, as long as you're still training pilots. Um, and so, you know, as you increase the ask in terms of capability, it's still going to be expensive, regardless of, of even if you're doing things more efficiently at the industrial level. In terms of the A-10, it's interesting that, you know, the USAF's fighter plan still says four plus one, and that plus one is the A-10, um, because for now they've kind of accepted that they can't get rid of it. Um, I do have some sympathy with them. I remember talking, you know, as, a, as an intern years ago, uh, I remember talking to General Walsh uh, when he was CSAF, um, just around the time the first A-10 retirement attempt was being made. Uh, and he, I remember him saying, you know, I love the A-10. It's a one, it's a fantastic CAS platform. Problem is, I don't think I can gain air superiority over the Chinese in five years' time, you know, as a given. And therefore, unless I can gain air superiority, the, the A-10 is a luxury. If the army wanted, they can pay me for it. But until that happens, I, you know, I need to ensure that I can gain air superiority. CAS is, is frankly a luxury until that happens. Um, and, you know, a lot of the actual, for example, if you look at uh, Gulf War, uh, the first Gulf War, you know, the A-10 supposed heyday where it did a huge amount of tank plinking. Um, you know, if you actually look at the numbers of tanks destroyed by various aircraft, I mean, A-10 was, was far down the list. Um, you know, more was being done by F F-16s, F-111s, tornadoes, uh, Apache, uh, all sorts. So, you know, again, it, it's loved by infantry for that the fact that it, it has a longer loiter time. It has the, the, the stabilization along with the excellent gun. Um, although if you actually look at, again, CAS sorties, the majority of them are, are PGMs, not the gun. Um, and, you know, arguably if you can't, if you can't afford the air force to get that air access that would enable a platform like an A-10 or indeed a Reaper, which frankly will, will do that job even better in most cases because the persistence is, 10 times what an even A-10 can give you. And the biggest value is that overhead ISR and, and that sort of long-term ability to provide a strike every so often, but tell you exactly what the enemy are doing. Um, you know, 
if your air force can't get you air superiority as the Russians are finding in Ukraine, you know, your CAS capability is arguably very tangentially relevant, if that. And so the USAF's argument was was always with the A-10, we, we can't afford to do our job, which is give you air dominance wherever you want. And therefore, we have to retire fleets. And the only fleet we can retire is the A-10 because we have other things that can do that job. Now, then politics gets in the way and marketing and all the rest. And people say, well, can it do the job as well? And the USAF feels they have to say, well, yes, of course it can do the job as well. And you go, well, no, because an A-10 is specifically designed to do that job and it does it at a very low price point, comparatively speaking. Although, if, interestingly, if you add in a couple of first or second gen SAMs, suddenly the A-10 doesn't look so hot um, in, in those areas. And so actually at that point, could an F-35 do close air support for, say, a special operations force team that was in an, uh, an area where you didn't want to do a full scale, you know, ground invasion or whatever, but you did want to have some close air support that was semi-deniable and be able to defend yourself if fired upon, well, arguably an F-35 might be a better choice there. And in fully permissive, Reaper's probably good, um, or Apache, um, which again, you know, there are other options for that mission set, or even AC-130, dare I say, I, I love that thing, it's it's so mad, um, aerial battleship. But um, yeah, I, I feel a bit bad for the USAF sometimes, because the, the pace of operational demand is so relentless that they've been left in a, in a position that having been promised that divest to invest would would be repaid several times over the past 15 years and then it hasn't um where <clears throat> they actually can't really meet their modernization requirements but they're still seeing no ability to to take the foot off the gas in terms of current ops and so you well either you've got to give them more money or they can't possibly modernize to give you the capability that politicians and the national security strategy demands. Um, it's tricky for them. I don't yeah. envy General Brown. Yeah, so as we heard from both Brian McGrath and Elaine Luria in episodes about the budget, a lot of this messaging is hill facing. Mm -hmm. um, and when we look at it practically, like you've just pointed out, A-10 doing CAS is not a day one of the war proposition. You got to work your way to that. And that's what the fanboys tend to forget uh, with all the hashtag Bert and the other stuff that comes out with the, the airplane. It's a cool airplane, very survivable. The stories are legendary. Um, so I'm not going to, I've worked with A-10s. Those guys are really good. When we were in the Tomcat over Southern Iraq doing FAC A in the early CNO approved, approved syllabus, I led a detachment to, uh, Al Jabber, and we worked, we briefed with these N A-10 guys, and they kind of taught us what close air support was all about. We thought we were badass because we'd done the you know, syllabus, and we realized we're kind of uh, not as good as they are. So I'm not going to talk any smack about the A-10. However, as you pointed out, when you go big picture on it, you know, it does have its limitations. So before we pivot, because you mentioned the Ukraine problem, and that's a good thing to pivot on, I just want to answer Jason's question here. Um, and thank you, Jason, for the uh, the super chat consideration there. Appreciate the support. So are stealth tankers in the pipeline for the Air Force? If not, why? <clears throat> um, not that I'm aware of. However, it is worth considering that uh, MQ-25 for the Navy is a currently mainlined as a tanker in terms of requirement. It was developed as an airframe design primarily for um, efficient ISR. Um, and if you look at the shape of it, it doesn't look like most stealth aircraft, but that's actually because it's designed for minimal radar cross-section when viewed from slightly below on the side, um, because that's where you'd typically be if you were in an ISR orbit with side-looking sensors um, at high altitude. And so it, has a you know it's being developed as a tanker um for the navy for now uh with a secondary isr role it technically kind of fits in as a, as a semi-stealthy tanker um the the primary issues being a as soon as you start putting pods on for tanking uh the the uh radar cross section will suffer um and one when, when you're actually tanking uh it's very difficult to have a minimal radar cross section with the hose and the, the general aircraft movements uh, and also, you you can tank in in full radio silence, but it's more tricky, especially if you're trying to find each other over large amounts of ocean and things like tacans might be being jammed or interfered with. Um, 
and the, the but, but primarily it's it's because the USAF is desperately trying to replace the KC-10, uh, so its biggest tankers, but there aren't a huge number of them, with KC-46, which is still in a multi multi year spiral of problems and delays and issues. Um, and you know, I'm not going to sit say as a European uh, with no satisfaction that the fact that what was termed KC-45, i.e. the A330 MRTT for the USAF, won the competition fair and square and would have been delivering them a capable platform as it has for any every other air force that operates it for the last 10 years had they not rewritten the competition with America first rules to satisfy Hill politics and then gone with the KC-46. But, you know. Um, all right, that's enough. Of there you. is that. Um, <laughs> no, no, but I mean, but, but in all seriousness, they there's they're already having so much trouble replacing the KC-10s and they're staring down the bow wave of having to replace the KC-135 fleet at some point. And if you count the Air National Guard uh, and the reserve squadrons plus the active duty squadrons, you're looking at north of 350 KC-135s. Um, so while a stealthy tanker or a more survivable tanker is a great idea, A, there's some physics issues with it, and B, it's just they can't afford to, and, and I can't program in fast enough replacing their existing tankers with conventional things and so trying to up that to go stealthy is, is probably a bit too far and for most missions with the tanker support you don't need a stealthy tanker so for qra support for quick reaction alert support or for cad support or for transits you, you don't need a stealthy tanker it's probably more efficient for those mission sets where you need really long range and survivability so the pacific being the obvious one for the us um it's probably more efficient to, to invest in things like B-21 that are able to tank from far enough away, far enough out, that tanker survivability is less of an issue. Um, but clearly for tactical fighters, that's a, a big ask, um, particularly for ones that don't have the legs of something like an F-15E. And hence, coming back to NGAD, why, well, why there's so really much high. prioritization there? Yeah. Well, although F-35 is interesting because it's it's got a semi-respectable range in the A version. I mean, you're talking 400 nautical miles plus, 450 to it, to, you know, on a high, high profile. Um, and its its efficiency actually is, is better over really long distances than in short distances, because for a normal traditional fighter where you're carrying external tanks and stores, that drag affects you for every mile you carry them. And so the further you fly, the more of a penalty those external stores give you in terms of drag, fuel burn, performance, etc. Um, especially in peacetime where you're not going to drop drop tanks when they're empty, you're going to carry them the whole way. Um, and so for an F-35 where everything's carried internally, it remains slick the entire way. Um, and, you know, ideally, uh, the, the Navy, have, of course, with the C version, with the much bigger wing, um, have you know, about 600 nautical miles of range uh, internally, which is pretty impressive. Um, and if you were to look at the potential, so for full block four, which is the, the next tranche of capability in uh, enhancements for the F-35, for full block four exploitation, they need more power and cooling, electrical power and cooling. And so there's, there's this new engine competition for what's called an adaptive cycle engine. Um, I think it's an adaptive cycle, um, a new engine, which as well as I think it's four times or eight times the, the electrical power and cooling supply uh, also boasts 10% more thrust and 25% improved fuel burn uh, in most regimes of flight. So if you start adding in a new engine a little further down the line where you've got maybe 25% better fuel burn, call it 15 under most flight conditions, um, let's be, be conservative, you're, you're, and you're starting to push quite respectable ranges with an F-15, uh, F-35C. And if the Air Force wants to fund it under the NGAD umbrella or any other umbrella, there is always the option of doing something like, because of course the real complexity in F-35 is, is in the, the software and the sensors, not really the airframe at this point, um, although it's, it's been tricky to get here. Um, but to do something like an F-35C wing form on an F-35A body, now, the, the, the wing and body are, are built together on the central fuselage, so it's not as simple as just swapping out wings, but you could envisage a future kind of F-35D, let's say, which combines the wing plan form of a C model without, ideally, the wing fold mechanism, the extra heavy gear, the, the arrestor hook, all of that stuff to make it carrier capable, but that adds a huge amount of weight, um, that just gives you that 
a much better fuel load and b much better turn performance better altitude performance um, because it lowers the wing loading um, better better maneuverability on an a model platform i mean with an adaptive cycle engine i mean you could be pushing easily 700 nautical miles of range on something like that um on internal fuel so you know there are options even with existing platforms it's just tricky um and as always money time and programmatic capacity are, are the big limitations not really technology no absolutely absolutely so last time you were on we were talking about the donbass phase of the campaign and whether the russians advantage in close air support would would matter mm. and so since it's been about a month since we had that conversation uh here's the latest uh sort of uh russian offensive lay down and quite frankly not much has changed since you and i were talking uh there have been some incremental gains by the russians in donbass the other headline is uh, the Russians have started shelling Kiev again, rocketing Kiev. That happened in the last 24 hours. Um, so uh, as we've, it seems like we say this every time we're talking about this topic, uh, the war is far from over. Um, every time we think that the Ukrainians might be turning the tide here, it's, it's, it hasn't happened. However, the, the latest, let's call it the tranche of weapons that the Americans and NATO are giving Ukrainian military. I did an entire episode about this where we did the laundry list of what they were giving them, notably javelins and stingers, as well as some radars that are any artillery. In fact, I saw a video that was a Russian TV station where the, you know, the, the journalist is there at an artillery unit, artillery piece, and, and the unit fires and he's talking, he's chatting, and immediately the counterfire comes right back and he runs away. Ah, you know, so it was kind of humorous uh, in terms of the Ukrainians' ability to react to artillery fire based on the stuff that we've given them. But most notably in the latest uh, offering has been uh, a couple of things. One is high Mars. Uh, so this is also up the ante, and we've heard some rhetoric from Putin in the last day that says, you know, if you use this, I'm going to consider that provocative and, you know, so forth and so on. Another sort of threat from him that if Americans give HIMARS or if the Ukrainians use HIMARS at our max, then that's a game changer and, and we're going to do something about it. Exactly what that means, I don't know. But then the other thing that's really provocative or potentially a game changer are these Gray Eagle drones that can carry up to four Hellfires. So what do we think about these pieces of gear against where we are on the ground? Are these game changers? What do we think? Um, <clears throat> so I'd say, I'd actually invert it. I would say um, HIMARS, uh, which is the, the wheeled version of uh, GMLRS that the system you showed there, and in fact, the UK has just announced it's going to be sending GMLRS, which is that version. Um, they they are, I would say, potential game changers in terms of what they will do to, or what they could do to Russia's ability to mass forces and to uh, conduct sustained artillery barrages without constantly having to move their artillery to, to avoid counter-battery. As, as you said, the Ukrainians... Uh, able to uh, put down counter-battery fire uh, pretty quickly on, on occasions. Um, th there's a few reasons. First of all, because HIMARS and GMLRS, um, A, they, they <clears throat> more or less double, slightly more than double, the range of the, the standard uh, grad, uh, BM21 uh, grad multiple launch rocket systems that the Ukrainians have been using. Uh, you know, grad, <clears throat> depending on the rocket, but it... it most of the rockets the Ukrainians have are between about 25 and 30 kilometer max range. Uh, HIMARS is pushing, HIMARS or GMLRS are pushing 70 plus, um, depending on the, the classification. Um, but um, they, so so they, they allow the Ukrainian forces to conduct strikes uh, on Russian artillery and, and vehicle positions from significantly beyond the retaliatory range of most Russian systems. So the, the Russian 300 millimeter uh, multiple launch rocket systems can potentially reach out that far. 
um, but most of their 220 mil and, and their 127 mil stuff doesn't, uh, and none of their tube artillery does. So A, it gives the Ukrainians a, a degree of, of range superiority and, uh, so that they can conduct uh, artillery fire with less risk. GMLRS and HIMARS also have pretty short uh, setup fire and uh, scoot times. So again, enhancing that survivability, being able to move before they're being before they're being found by UAVs or, or, or counter battery radar and then fired on. Um, they can be reloaded pretty quickly, so their rate of fire is actually much higher than comparable Russian systems. Uh, and if there's a GPS signal, they're extremely accurate. Um, even in GPS degraded environments, they they have uh, significantly better accuracy than than Russian equivalents. Uh, and the some of the um, cluster munition warhead payloads or payloads, however you want to say it, um, that the US could supply with them uh, have well, what's called brilliant submunitions, which basically dispense uh, skeets. So they they uh, release a bunch of um, miniature bomblets, which kind of spin as they descend and search in a comb for vehicle heat signatures and then fire shaped charges down onto them. Um, so if you put one of those on a, uh, on a let's say, a crossroads or, or an assembly area of Russian vehicles or, or artillery um, vehicles that you uh, have located, then you could destroy potentially quite a few of them or disable a few of them, even with a single rocket. So it's an advanced system in terms of its warhead effects, its range, uh, its setup and fire times. It's, it's pretty accurate and precise even on grid squares, even without being integrated into a, a more sophisticated fire control system as, as it would be uh, in US service. Um, so I, I think it is, you know, really quite significant, um, especially because the only way that the Russians are, are, are continuing to make some progress uh, around Popasna and, and Sverdonets, although interestingly, the Ukrainians seem to be conducting a fairly effective counteroffensive in, in Sverdonets itself uh, over the last two days, some conflicting reports on that. Um, but the, the way the Russians have been making ground is by concentrating uh, all their forces on really, a, in terms of offensive forces, on really a very small area of front and basically just conducting mass artillery bombardments until there's very little left in terms of defensive positions. And then basically, for once the Ukrainians have to fall back, just then taking the positions relatively unopposed. What they're not doing much of anymore is attempting large scale offensive maneuver operations because they just don't have the force densities anymore. They don't, they've taken too many losses. I mean, at this point, Russian confirmed tank losses are at 760 MBTs. Um, so 76 full battalion tactical groups worth, and they've only put in 130 battalion tactical groups out of 160-ish that they can sustain as an army. Um, so, you know, in terms of 100% losses, that's 76 of those 130 they put up. I mean, that's huge. By any normal measure, this is a combat ineffective army. And the fact that they're continuing to take offensive action and therefore will continue to sustain losses um, is interesting. But because they're having to concentrate forces in such small areas now, HIMARS is, is going to really potentially either punish that sort of concentration or force them to disperse and move more frequently, which will further slow the already kind of grinding and slow pace of advance there. Um, in terms of uh, Grey Eagle, the, the MQ-1C, um, it's an interesting one because it's, it's a very capable um, medium altitude long endurance class UAV. Um, it's got impressive beyond line of sight and line of sight uh, control capabilities, can be armed with four Hellfire um, missiles, and it has a very good sensor suite, including a GMTI radar capability. I think the latter is probably the most significant in the sense that if the Ukrainians can operate it survivably uh, within range of contested areas, sensor range that is, that ground, that ground moving target indicator radar capability could be really significant in terms of allowing them to queue in artillery fire, not least from things like HIMARS, um, onto Russian vehicle movements. But in terms of the direct fire capabilities with Hellfire, I mean, Hellfire uh, is, is generally seeker limited by range. It's not so much kinematic. It's, it's how far the seeker can either acquire a laser spot for the laser laser Hellfire or um, uh, an, IR, <clears throat> an IR lock with an IR MAV. Um, and it's, you know, it's about you know, give or take, but it's about eight kilometers from most altitudes. Um, and that's that's nowhere close to enough to give you standoff um, from a non-stealthy, uh, relatively medium to high altitude operating UAV in an area where the, the Russian ground-based air defense coverage is extremely dense. You know, they've got everything from, you know, the sort of shore stuff 
mix of man pads, um, <clears throat> SA15 Tor um, Pantsir, which is probably less of an issue. Um, but then also SA17, including the M3s, um, the, the newest variant deployed with a range of up to 75 kilometers um, and decent radars. They've got AWACS coverage queuing in some of those systems. They've got S400s down in, in Crimea, as well as in, in Belgorod Oblast. Um, again, with the ability to queue in some of those long range shots with A50s, uh, the AWACS. Um, and of course, they have, they're, they're conducting significant fighter patrols um, in the Donbass as well with SU-35, which have proven pretty good at hunting down TB2s, so which, which are cheaper and less capable than, than MQ-1C, but they are also able to fly lower and slower and kind of blend into clutter better, and there are more of them. So in many ways, I'd actually expect TB2 to be more survivable in this sort of environment than MQ-1C, uh, despite the fact that MQ-1C is a much more capable platform. Um, so yeah, significant standoff sensor role, yes, potentially, depends how capable the Russian long-range SAM systems are. Um, in terms of direct Hellfire strikes, I, I doubt it. Um, I, I think actually it's just too too dense uh, an air defense environment there. Um, and you know we saw uh, you know, Ukrainian Air Force flying very few sorties into Donbass now, um, including with TB2, not many in, in frontline areas. And we already saw yesterday uh, the Ukrainians shoot down one of their own, or, or either it was shot down by the Russians or potentially one of their own, um, an Su-27, which uh, clearly tried to, to fly into Donbass as well. So, you know, it's a, it's a, I would say, heavily contested, close to denied airspace uh, in Donbass. And it's not really where you want a, a male class ARP has. So you had this on your Twitter page some weeks <laughs> ago, um, has some specifics about the Su-25 um, so is there anything that we can glean from, from this tweet that, uh, Guy did? Yeah. Guy Plopsky is, he does an extraordinary job, uh, trawling through, uh, endless Russian agit prop, um, to get these, these good bits of footage. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the Sukhoi 25s are continuing to, to conduct regular, um, strike and close air support sorties in Donbass at very low altitude, um, you know, generally 100 feet or 250 feet max um, for most of their flights. But they're almost exclusively using these uh, BL-13 um, unguided rockets. And uh, a lot of the time from the hub footage that they're releasing, they're actually doing something similar to the, um, the helicopters in the sense of pitching up and firing it at a, a positive angle um, for increased standoff uh, range to target, but of course, very, very limited accuracy. Um, and so, you know, I, I just don't think there's a huge amount of, of effectiveness there. I'm impressed, actually, by how few Su-25s the Russians have been losing doing these sorties. I mean, they, it has a much higher flare capacity than most uh, Russian aircraft. And so, you know, they can consistently release flares for most of all time um, into those areas at low altitude. So man pads effectiveness will be lower. But, you know, given how often they're flying in there. And to me, it's quite impressive. They only, they've only lost, I think, 11 of them so far um, in, in the war and that we know of. And so, you know, clearly their countermeasure suites are working relatively well. They're only losing them at a trickle rate, but they're generally only firing rockets uh, in a single pass uh, and often from significant distance and they're unguided. So while I'm sure it's terrifying to be on the receiving end, uh, I don't think it's particularly effective cows from what I can see. And we had this tweet, uh... You retweeted the U Ukraine weapons tracker. It was just a, a helo shot down. Um, so the Ukrainian man pads, their SAM effort is still working against certainly rotary wing assets. Um, so do we know last time where we counted sort of the sortie ratio was about 100 to 10, um, which I guess is 10 to 1. Um, I was told there would be no math on my live streams. Uh, but uh, how are we looking now? Is is the Ukrainian Air Force flying at all? Uh, they are flying, um, as unfortunately evidenced by losing one the other day. Um, but I think it's still a very, very low sortie rate compared to the Russians. And it is probably about 10 to 1. It's like, you know, 5 to 10 sorties a day was the last I heard from the Ukrainians. That was a little while ago. It may be a bit higher now. Um, but uh, as I say, not much into Donbass on the regular um, and the Russians still keeping up somewhere between about 200 and 300 sorties a day, um, mostly fighter patrols, but uh, and Sukhoi 25 low level strikes. Um, uh, the the only kind of significant precision guided munition use seems to be the Sukhoi 34 fleet firing, um, you know, TV guided missiles and things. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there is still air activity going on, but it, you know, the main killer in, in on both sides is artillery. 
um, rather than air. Like we ask every time we talk about the tactical situation on the ground there, what do we think the end state looks like? Is there any exit for either side at this point, or are we kind of dug in here? Um, and what we see is what we're going to have incremental gains and just destruction of cities, kind of like Mariupol. They started taking out some other cities in a similar fashion. As you say, they just sort of lay waste with long range munitions the population leaves and they just wander in to what end? I don't know. I mean, that's what I I'm left wondering. Okay. You now have this ground. What do you intend to do with it? Right. What is the, what's the strategic thing for Putin at any point here? I mean, it just seems like fruitless and, and wasteful at this point. I, I think the Russians are still continuing with this offensive for two reasons. Primarily, I think because they don't really have any better ideas. Um, you know, the, the the prospects of what happens if they try and basically pause and, and try and sell what they've got as worth the enormous cost uh, are not good. But equally, they don't really have the capacity. You know, they clearly decided they couldn't afford politically to fully try and mobilize and that anyway, it would take too long to generate relevant forces. Um, and so they're kind of left in limbo that they, they can't really up operations, really. Um, they're doing as much as they can. They're pretty much at the limit. Of what they can do offensively, and at the same time, at the same time, they they can't really accept that they that they've only got what they've got. So they're sort of in limbo. To me, the the big question is how exhausted the Ukrainians are, and we just don't know because they've been extremely good at concealing the scale of their losses. Um, we know they're very heavy in this in this phase of the war. Um, you know, fifty to one hundred a day has been mentioned. Um, but you know, if they're capable of serious counteroffensive action in the coming weeks. Um, not only in Donbass, but of course, east of, of Kharkiv and, and around Kherson, then I think actually we could see quite rapid r Russian reverses because I don't think the Russians have enough forces to continue their assaults in Donbass and protect their whole front lines properly. And as we saw in the north, if the Ukrainians do penetrate and start threatening to seriously cut off supply routes, the Russians will just have to retreat. If the Ukrainians are too exhausted and can't do that, then I think we'll see a significant you know, long grinding kind of line of contact war um, across most of Luhansk and, and down into the south held by Russia and the rest of the country held by Ukraine. Um, I'm afraid I, I might have to do it for me um, for the day. Yeah. I'll have to run to another meeting, but uh, okay. it's been fun as always. All right. Well, Justin, always great to have you on the channel. We'll have you back soon to talk about your impressions of Top Gun Maverick. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. The, the we'll do it another time. The F-35 as, uh, as can't be done because of GPS. Um, but Thank you, Justin. Be well, and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Take care. Thanks for having me on. All right, everybody, that'll do it for this live stream. As always, please, if you're not a subscriber, subscribe. Give me the likes and comments. When I'm done with this live stream, it'll immediately be an episode on the channel. Um, so uh, come back and check it out. Then that'll include the comments as well. As always, don't forget, punks, Trilogy is on sale everywhere. In fact, the Punk's Wing audiobook was just released a couple days ago. So check Amazon.com for that. Punk's Fight will come out in audio form at the end of this month, rather. Uh, the Punk's Wing was released at the end of May. I can't believe it's already June. Time's going so fast. But you can get it in print either at Amazon or USNI.org. If you go to USNI.org, use the discount code Punk. YT, P-U-N-K-Y-T, for 25% off on the uh, trade paperbacks and also the bundle, uh, which is still have a, a limited edition, a limited number of those left. So as always, thanks for your support of this channel. Appreciate it. And I look forward to talking to you guys again very soon.